How are you guys doing today? I'm Ellis Chavin, but y'all can just call me Chappie. I'm pretty informal. I'm not going to get real crazy about this. I did a study about pretty much the same study as Shannon did, except I did it in four sites over the Gulf of Mexico comparing, comparing biofouling on oyster grows. So oyster production in the Gulf of Mexico is traditionally on bottom. It's mostly tong and dredge based. It still dominates. To quote my buddy Brian Callum, off bottom culture is just a drop in the bucket to what on bottom culture still is. But with that said, off bottom culture is gaining favor in Florida, here in Mobile, in Louisiana, Mississippi, and it seems to be a movement that's growing. So one of the problems with oyster grows and off bottom fouling, as you know, is biofouling. In the Gulf of Mexico, hard fouling is our main problem. We don't have much as a problem with soft fouling. And Shumway 2012 said that 15% of all costs of off-bottom culture are associated with biofouling. So this is mostly just paying your growers to hose off your bags or to flip your cages weekly or whenever in your increments. And the current management of that would involve flipping cages, flipping bags, and anti-fouling coatings. So in my project, I used, air, I used oyster grows, the six slot cage. Um, they're pretty convenient. They're made for aerial exposure. And I tested it in weekly, biweekly, and triweekly increments. And for phonetics, I'm also going to use that, those terms as Shannon did. And our friends at Netmeyer, we also compo compared the coating of these bags. And we wanted to see how well the coating lasts, if it does deter biofouling, and how we could use that in to future plans. Now, I had four sites throughout the Gulf, with Grand Isle, Louisiana, being my host site in Louisiana with Dr. Soup, with Dr. Supan. Dr. Walton here in Mobile helped me with my site at Navy Cove Oyster Company in Fort Morgan. In Mississippi, with the help of Jason Ryder, I had a location just outside of Biloxi on the other side of Dog Island. And in Florida, with Leslie and Reggie's help, we worked and did a study in Cedar Key. Now, the goals of this study was specifically just to affect, does bilofouling affect oyster production on the bag weights, the fan and cup ratios, the growth rates, time to harvest, meat weights, the overall condition of the oyster itself, and their mortalities. Now, I deployed in September of 17, and every three months I'd go out, grab 10 oysters at random, measure their length, width, and height, while also taking a picture for photographic analysis to get a percent fouling. Now, the results of my study showed that there was no effect on bag coating or pontoon coating on the bag weights. But what we do see is that we see that our weekly exposures had less overall weight coming out of the bags. This is the wet weight of the bag coming out of the oyster grow, and we see that the weekly oysters had less fouling and less weight on them than the biweekly and triweeklies. The biweeklies and triweeklies kind of started to act like each other in a lot of the test variables in this study. Now the growth rates, and this looks a little weird, but we see that the first column on the left is our weeklies, and they're divided into flip regime, one, two, and three. And you can see that the weekly growth were definitely stunted a little bit. And also by the time we got to our second sampling, our bi-weeklies and everything past that were ready to harvest. So the growth rates in the Gulf of Mexico are much faster, and this should also be taken into account when you're looking into management practices. Now, the weight and volume displacement. So when I grabbed my final harvest, I took the oysters and I had their, the weight of the oyster with all the fouling still on it. And I weighed that. And then I took the volume displacement, dropped it in a cup, got see how many milliliters were displaced in that cup. I took that same oyster, shucked it, got the weight and the volume again. These graphs show the differences in those weights and those volumes. So you can see that after it was weighed, there was about half as much fouling on average on the weekly oysters than there was on the biweekly and triweeklies. And at the same time, there was the same kind of results from the volume displacement. There was about half as much volume on the weekly oysters than there was the biweekly and triweekly. This is a literal, this literally says that fouling does affect the, uh, the oyster and how much how much oysters, how much fouling is on the oysters due to flip regime. Now, we started to look at the oyster qualitatively and quantitatively. There was an index that Bill showed us called the Australian Seafood Index, and it pretty much just studied the body, mantle, and fullness of the oyster, and it gave it a rating of zero to three. Zero the best, three, 
Three is the worst. Now I took those three categories and I added all of those scores together. And on the left, we can see qualitatively that the sum of those scores on the bi-weekly and the tri-weekly oysters were twice as high as our weekly oysters. So qualitatively, our weekly oysters were twice as good as our bi-weekly and tri-weekly oysters. Also, the graph on the right shows the condition index, and that's a relative meat to shell ratio. And this shows that the weekly oysters had meatier oysters, which shows you're getting meatier oysters and you have qual more, twice as quality oysters at the same time. Now, the growth rates, ironically, the tri-weekly oysters lived the, the best. However, all of those are right around 90%, and there's not much different in the mortality between the weeklies and the tri-weeklies. The bi-weeklies actually had the lowest mortality. So, looking at these, we see that these weekly oysters, they did have a slower growth. They may have had a smaller mortality, but there was also much less fouling. Their meats were much greater, their quality looked better, and the bi-weeklies and the tri-weeklies seemed to react similarly. We didn't see much of an effect on coating on the bags or the pontoons as it related to any of the test variables. So what does this mean? It means that proper management, meaning weekly flips, are going to be necessary in the Gulf of Mexico. If you're not going to go out there and flip your cages weekly or very relatively regular, you're going to let the fouling take over. And I think looking at those qualitative and quantitative indexes, that literally shows fouling does affect the oyster itself. So when you're doing this, you want to make sure what kind of quality do you want in your oyster and your farm? What kind of meats do you want to be known for? And also, a big question, I think, is what's your market? Are you selling to shucking houses? Are you going to get 20 to 25 cents an oyster? Or are you selling these to bars and half shell markets in downtown New Orleans from Mobile for 75 cents or a dollar an oyster? And I think that if you take that compensation of those growth rates and you put it towards your economic analysis of what market you're going towards, you could find out that just waiting a little bit longer to harvest your oyster may give you a better product overall. And so with that, I want to thank all the partners involved with this, and I'll take your questions now. I don't know if there was really that much difference in mudworms specifically. I saw a lot of stone crabs throughout all of them. Um, we didn't have the soft fouling that Shannon had on the Atlantic coast. All of our fouling was pretty much spat mussels and barnacles and algae. And worms weren't that big of an issue to me. Before you move on, I would say, Lou, we, we did some work in, in Alabama, and we found a, a huge difference in mud worms between one week and two weeks of, of drying. Yeah, except a lot of times when we were getting into the summer months, we could only do it from like 4 p.m. to 10 a.m. because some of that daytime stress will kill a lot of those oysters, I think. We didn't take the man hours in, but you're right. I mean, if you had a farm of about 100 or 200 cages, that'd take you a good couple hours at least, and depends on how many hands you have. And not to mention you'd have to come back the next day to flip them back over. We didn't take that into account, but that's a good point. There was no in situ monitors. We didn't take any actual chemistry problems, but we have a salinity and a temperature chart. I don't have it with me here, but we did, that's all. Made. That's really awesome. So this man said the man hours can really, the, f the p spraying off your cages afterwards, you're gonna have, you're right. You can either pay someone to flip your cages regularly and flip them back, or don't do it at all. And at the end, you're gonna have to pay someone to spray off all of your pontoons, all of your bags, and, and individually shuck the oysters, exactly. So there is definitely trade-offs that would have to be looked into for a full economic analysis, I think. So one thing that I really didn't get to talk about in this is the benefit of the tumbling action with the weekly oysters. Now, when we would flip our tri-weekly oysters, we'd find out by the end of the study, so April or May, especially in like Louisiana and Mississippi, those tri-weeklies would flip back. Like a lot of times when you're, especially with those weekly oysters, you're constantly tumbling them. And so they're constantly moving themselves about the cage. And that gives them a lot of like cleaning action, so to speak. And I think that if you can just distribute the oysters evenly throughout the cage and kind of tumble them up as they air dry, I think you can mitigate that. I don't have a full analysis on it, but I do believe bag position does play a big position, big big influence on it. I think those middle cages are going to get more biofouling 
and those cages on the outsides get wind and wave action more, and actually that reduces the fouling. Well, yeah, and they're going to get more solar exposure too. Yeah, the composting from the others are not, they're going to get covered, you're right. There was some polydora, but we didn't really take that into our assessment. Overnight, so like from in the evening, like four or five in the evening, till in the morning, like nine or ten. Um, I, you don't want to stress them out during the day, but I'd say at least a good 12 to 18 hours at least, preferably 18 to 24. I'm, I'm not going to say I know completely the time regime of the efficacies, but I would say you'd want to do it at least 18 hours, if I had to guess. Yes, sir. Well, I would say that uh, smaller oysters are less susceptible to the fouling than the larger ones. I think that's a surface area thing, and there's more area for a spat to attach to, but I didn't notice a difference in the juveniles and the adults. All right. Thank you very much, Chappie. Thank you.